Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Masaro Method. I am so excited today to welcome Operator Starsky. Starsky is a big blogger, has a huge YouTube channel, but most importantly, he is a Ukrainian National Guardsman, a member of the Ukrainian National Guard. He has been putting up content, videos, interviews, all sorts of commentary since the beginning of Russia's genocidal invasion, and he's been an absolutely critical member of the community informing the outside world about the crimes of Russia, but also the valor and bravery that we have seen from Ukrainians and also some of the uh, international uh, elements that have come to support Ukraine. So, Starsky, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being invited. So, as always, before we begin, please share, like, comment, subscribe, get these voices heard, and keep the channel growing. So, Starsky, if we could just start sort of very simply with some simple background for those that do not know for the audience, what is the Ukrainian National Guard and who are you? Uh, Ukrainian National Guard is a military force that is uh, attached to the Minister of Interior, um, unlike our army that is uh, that belongs to the Ministry of Defense. But uh, currently, because there is war, uh, we uh, work together with the Ministry of Defense, uh, performing same tasks before uh, because uh, there are multiple mechanized brigades uh, in the National Guard that uh, basically have the same tasks uh, as uh, other army units. And uh, my brigade is one of those. Uh, it's called the Rapid Response Brigade of the National Guard of Ukraine. It's also called the Frontier. And uh, I'm a press officer in this brigade. Okay, rapid response in that you guys are popping in when Russians show up or are you, I mean, what is the, what are you responding to rapidly? Uh, basically, our mission is to uh, meet the enemy yes. uh, and uh, stop any uh, advance or offensive in that area uh, and uh, wait until the heavy cavalry arrives, uh, meaning our uh, army and uh, our paratroopers or whoever it is. Yeah, I see. Okay, so... I've got a few questions for you based on some of your videos and some of the work you've done uh, that I found interesting. Uh, but but let me first sort of ask, uh, you know, I mean, what is we're we're a year into this invasion now, and obviously, you know, I mean, Ukraine has already pulled off what many considered impossible, um, you know, and I mean, continues to pull off every day what many consider impossible. What is the feeling at the moment? I know we are all sort of in this place of expecting or fearing or maybe even seeing in some part um, uh, heightened Russian aggression. Russia is continuing to push these uh, mobics sort of into the meat grinder. So, I mean, what is the, how are, how are, how are people holding up? Um, I will talk on behalf of military people. Okay. Yes. Uh, because, because I am one and uh, I can say that uh, we are pretty much tired uh, because, you know, we uh, were much more confident last year. Uh, last year we saw that uh, Russian army can be stopped, it can be destroyed, their personnel can be eliminated in huge numbers. And uh, basically, as of today, we have uh, completely eliminated the amount of uh, Russian troops that were used to invade Ukraine in the beginning of the year. So they lost 130,000 uh, men and uh, approximately three times as much uh, were wounded. Uh, at the same time, they decided to mobilize uh, more men and now we have approximately half a million Russians uh, on the uncontrolled territory, on the occupied territory. But at the same time, um, we know that this is just another challenge because uh, we know that uh, we can eliminate them efficiently. And uh, basically in a year, they managed to lose all the territories that uh, they uh, captured, except for uh, 
some territories in the uh, area of Mariupol, it's a Donetsk region, um, and uh, some minor territories, and uh, they only managed to uh, capture 10-20 uh, kilometers in the area of uh, Bakhmut, north of Bakhmut, uh, which means that the, the, the speed of their advance is ridiculous. Uh, and currently they don't have enough personnel to um, perform attacks in multiple uh, directions. So uh, we know that this is just another challenge, and if we have to eliminate half a million Russians, we will do that, because uh, our existence depends on this. Of course. Yeah, I mean, it's... They're, they're able to grind it to a stalemate, essentially, for a while, given that they can throw all these untrained... Uh, uh, individuals in there who are then mowed down, but I can understand how that is both physically and psychologically tedious and exhausting <laughs> to, yeah. to, to have to face these individuals down. What can we in the United States, obviously, but also in sort of the G7 and, and in the democratic world, the, the democratic allies that have been supporting do better and, and, and know in order to not only get you the weapons you need, but also to to help increase morale and to demonstrate that we're, you know, with you in this. I can tell you definitely that, uh, you know, any sort of uh, presence of our foreign, uh, foreign uh, allies and friends is a big psychological help to Ukrainians um, because, you know, it's dangerous to come to Ukraine right now. Every city, even cities on the west of Ukraine, far away from the front line, they are still subject to cruise missile attacks. Uh, so it's unsafe. But at the same time, uh, even you know, he hearing uh, foreign language uh, on the streets of Ukraine and things like that, it, it it's a huge uh, motivational factor for us. Um, as for the military aid, I think that uh, if uh, foreign politicians and foreign rulers really want to save Ukraine, uh, other than just uh, you know show all the destruction and, and Russian committed atrocities and things like that, if, if uh, saving Ukraine is their actual goal, right? Uh, my opinion, they have to multiply the amount of um, delivered vehicles by 10. Because uh, one way or another, Russians still have uh, around 6,000 tanks, uh, let alone their armored vehicles. They had uh, 10,000 uh, tanks in the beginning of this invasion, but uh, we managed to improve uh, 3,000 Russian tanks and capture a bit more. But uh, they still have 6,000 tanks that can be brought to Ukraine. And we are talking about uh, 10, 20, 30 tanks that will be sent to Ukraine, which is discussed in different uh, countries. Uh, what makes me, let's say, not, uh, not furious, but uh, a bit disappointed is that uh, during those uh, Budapest um, um, that, that Budapest event, right, that took place in 1994, Ukraine gave up um, 1,700 nuclear warheads. Yeah. How many tanks uh, can you exchange for 1,700 nuclear warheads? And people still discussing, like, do we send 14 or 15 tanks to Ukraine? It's ridiculous. No, I mean, I... You'll, you'll find no argument from me. That's that's entirely my view as well. Um, I mean, we're not even we're not even in the right ballpark. Although, I mean, I, you know, I mean, again, it, it's no it's no consolation. But I, but I do believe that we will get there. I mean, we've already gone from 20 to 178 from Germany. You know, I mean, and it's going to go higher than that. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just it's just it's it's so we're, we're constantly talking ourselves in circles and we're we're we need to convince one another and the political work in this is so tedious. I mean, it doesn't, it's frustrating and it doesn't make any sense, but I think we are going to arrive where we need to be that the, I mean, the, the concern of course is what is taking so long and every day of delay is more Ukrainian lives, you know? So, yeah. so we really need to be moving more quickly. So, so tell us about these, 
you've you've mentioned you know hearing foreign languages and you've you've done videos on um you know the international elements that are both fighting in ukraine and sort of based in ukraine can you can you tell us a little bit about the the foreigners you've met in ukraine um those that are fighting but also maybe those that are delivering um goods and all, all that kind of stuff i mean um what what are your i guess what is what is struck you know what is what has struck you about these individuals um, I can say that I met all kinds of people here, uh, starting from um, warriors that actually fight for Ukraine and uh, not only uh, uh, warriors from the West. There are also Russian people fighting for Ukraine in the uh, Russian battalion called uh, Freedom for Russia. And uh, those are basically decent Russians. Th th that's uh, how I can call them. Um, and there are different people from uh, Europe as well as uh, America, Asian countries. Uh, countries that uh, actually surprised me because there are also volunteers from Iran, Myanmar and countries like that. Um, at the same time, I met a lot of um, people who do uh, other important things like demining. Uh, there were some great guys from um, New Zealand, Australia, Canada and the UK, Ireland, um, people that do demining here in my area and uh, other areas. There were uh, vol civilian volunteers uh, bringing different stuff like vehicles for Ukrainian soldiers, like providing uh, civilians with uh, psychological relief. And uh, there were also uh, medics that uh, my, my buddy Brandon that is now working in the um, area of Bakhmut. Uh, he, is a, a, he is a former military, but uh, he has this huge um, experience in uh, combat medicine and he saves lives so um, basically we uh, have all kinds of uh, support from military to uh, to I don't know medical support and things like that yeah and these are all volunteers right I mean these are these are individuals who have come of their own volition and own accord to volunteer on the Ukrainian side yeah, yeah, exactly. And also there's uh, a lot of uh, just civilian people living in Ukraine. Uh, my buddy Johnny FD, who, uh, who lives in Kyiv, who received um, a res resident ship of Ukraine, as well as other people, journalists uh, that, uh, you know, risk their life a lot on the front lines. Um, and uh, they also do great job, in my opinion. No, that's that's terrific. And that's uh, I mean, it's a real inspiration. I mean, those people are direct action, you know, not 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 in this endless circular debate that we're all in in the in the political world. But in fact, just getting in there and and taking action. And that's a that's a that's a really wonderful thing. And they are they are um, incorporated. The, the warriors and medics are incorporated under the Ministry of Defense. They are they're the International Legion. Or how is that? Um, how is that laid out? Not only International Legion, because uh, in the Armed Forces of Ukraine, you can join any unit oh, that okay. you want. Yes, because... You'll uh, be with the, Ukrainians. Uh, that, yes, like for foreigners, because yeah. uh, there is uh, different... Like, uh, Foreign Legion is a separate uh, unit. Let's call it this uh -huh. way. It's a separate force. Um Basically, you can apply for any uh, Ukrainian unit as a foreigner and uh, you will be accepted uh, and, and you can fight. Um, we had that in the armed forces of Ukraine since uh, 2015. Uh, didn't have a lot of volunteers, not as much as today, of course. Uh, but there were still people that uh, served in the armed forces of Ukraine officially. Uh, they are officially employed. It's not like mercenaries or... Mm -hmm. you know, those... Oh, yeah convicts brought by Russians, uh, th they have official employment, uh, salary, and uh, eventually they receive re residency in, in Ukraine as well. Yeah, I saw today that that Wagner fella that, that, that held up the skull uh, is no longer among the living. So it's karma. Uh, yeah, karma. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice story of karma. So now he can 
you know, justify that to uh, the Almighty, you know. Yeah. So um, I, I wanted to actually, on the, on the topic of Russians, uh, I know that you've also had the opportunity to communicate with some of the Russians. Um, and I, I guess I, I mean, what are your, what are your impressions? I mean, I mean, who, who are these people that, that, that are stealing washing machines and, uh, you know, getting tossed into this conflict uh, to, to be a, to be in this meat grinder and, I mean, give us give us some idea of your conversations. Basically, it's like uh, people who were brainwashed for decades uh, and they were convinced that they are uh, God's chosen nation. Uh, everybody else is stupid and weak and Russians are so great because they have like uh, they were chosen by God. They have this Russian Orthodox Church. They have the spiritual connection with uh, nature, cosmos, Mars, uh, and and gods and whatever. And uh, the worst thing was that uh, during those decades of brainwashing, uh, they were uh, brainwashed into hating everybody. So uh, they hate like they hate all the west of course but specifically they hate ukraine because uh, they were invading ukraine over and over again uh, for almost 1000 years and uh, they never managed to uh, connect ukraine to attach it completely to the territory of russia uh, because uh, we always managed to become independent one way or another and uh, that's why they hate us so much. And basically this invasion, all this war is based on hatred towards Ukrainians. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been the takeaway of a lot of, I mean, I, I think for the, I think for the, the West, for those of us that have worked in this space for a long time, even, and then for those experts that have, I guess, studied Russia. I mean, this is, this has come as something of a surprise. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been kind of a, a symptom of not listening to Ukrainians and not listening to Poles and sort of buying the Russian narrative for a very long time that we missed, um, this kind of deep level of imperial resentment, essentially that, that these individuals are coming in with. I mean, that's how you get these kind of, um, you know, people in the West that still insist this is a product of NATO, you know, and NATO, NATO, NATO expansion or whatever. When in fact, I think that's exactly right. I think those takeaways, I mean, this is, this is about domination of Ukraine as it's been about for hundreds of years, you know, I mean, and, 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 and is this, is this the last time? I mean, is this the, is this the time where, Ukraine can finally sort of win permanently and will this be the will be will this be the last Russian invasion of Ukraine after after like so many over so many years it uh, will be the last invasion of uh, of uh, Russia into Ukraine uh, as soon as Ukraine is accepted into NATO or uh, yeah. given some kind of uh, solid security guarantees uh, because those guarantees that were given during Budapest memorandum and and uh, other um, events, they don't work, obviously. We have anything yep. but security here. Um, again, uh, there's a lot of people claiming and trying to justify right this invasion by saying that uh, NATO was going to expand, you know, and Russia was opposing this. Russia never opposed the expansion of NATO like uh, in history, uh, Gorbachev, uh, Gorbachev directly said that uh, during uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, nobody talked about it and uh, nobody from the Russian side were uh, concerned about NATO expansion. They didn't even like talk about it completely. Uh, then Ukraine, yet in 2008, uh, if not 2010, uh, Ukraine still, according to its doctrine, uh, considered West and uh, NATO as potential enemies. 
we didn't plan to join NATO. And we only started talking about joining NATO when we realized that Russia was like a real threat, probably around uh, 2015, 2016. And it was already uh, two years after our territories were annexed by Russia. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about Crimea and uh, we're talking about Donbass uh, regions that were occupied only after two years, probably since since those events, we started thinking probably we should join NATO because like, you know, those those guys are crazy. Um, so that's yeah, that's another thing. Ukraine was never part of NATO, but now we're seriously considering joining, of course, because uh, Russians uh, forced us to do so. Well, I mean, in, in my view, NATO would be lucky to have you. I think that I think that Ukraine has shown it is, you know, as far as combat goes, perhaps the most uh, effective military fighting force on the European continent um, and one of the most ready. You know, uh, I mean, I, I, I think that it's it would be a great addition to NATO. I think it would help me sleep more soundly at night. Uh, knowing we have the Ukrainians at our back, and it's something I think we we would really like to see. I think, though, that the, you know, the reality, I mean, uh, you know, again, I, I hate talking about the reality because you can always change political realities. Political realities are never in stone. I mean, Jesus, before this full-scale invasion, the political reality was Germany was doing Nord Stream 2, you know? I mean, so political realities change all the time, so it's a bad way to talk about that. But, But I think it's going to be difficult to get NATO member states to agree to admit Ukraine until Ukrainian victory, because there will be this kind of assumption that this would mean, you know, joining the war. Um, so when, I mean, I mean, when, when in your view, what, what will it take to achieve Ukrainian victory? And that is, that is to say, I mean, if you, if you have a different idea of victory, I'm also interested. Um, our, our idea of victory, at least looking at it from the outside, has been a return to 1991 borders, a complete reclamation of, of stolen Ukrainian territory, a complete liberation of Ukraine. Absolutely. Uh, we can even return to uh, the borders of 2003, because that's exactly uh, the year when uh, Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin and Ukrainian President uh, Kuchma signed uh, a resolution recognizing each other's borders. Mm. Uh, so he officially signed uh, the, the paper that recognized borders of modern Ukraine, which are basically uh, the same as in 1991. Uh, so uh, I agree on that. One of our uh, goals is to return those borders of 1991. Uh, we want to push out those uh, invaders uh, out of Ukraine, we want to return uh, people who were kidnapped. Uh, and uh, of course, we want to bring criminals to justice because uh, they want they need to uh, face justice for all the crimes they committed. Uh, I think they can keep toilets. We can and maybe we a can washing buy... machine or two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, washing machine. I don't know, like it's it's more like uh, more sophisticated stuff. It's more but, personal, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, toilets they can keep. Okay, we can buy new ones. Uh, we have enough money for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, as for the rest, uh, th th those are the goals basically. Because uh, if Russia goes unpunished away from this uh, conflict, the, this horrible invasion. Uh, then it will be a sign for other maniacs that basically oh, yeah. they can do the same. And there's a lot of maniacs. Um, so well, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I, I actually just had a, given the Syrian earthquake and all that, revisited uh, with my Syrian friends who point, the, point that out immediately and say that the West's lack of response when it came to Russia's bombing of Syrian civilians and, and this kind of overstepping red lines without response basically gave the green light um, for the initial invasion of Ukraine. I mean, I agree with that. I, I, I think you're exactly right. If Russia, if Ukraine isn't returned to 1991 borders, we should be anticipating further invasions of, you know, democratic states by tyrants, whether it's China and Taiwan or whether it's Putin and 
some NATO state or Moldova or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree on that. Uh, Syria, uh, it, it's, it's a good lesson for, for all of us. Um, and uh, again, we are so uh, grateful to the Syrian people because, you know, when this invasion started, they started sharing their experience with us. And first thing they uh, told us was you should keep your shelters for civilians, specifically for kids, in secret from Russians. Because if you start writing those huge letters on houses and whatever that don't bomb kids are here, they will specifically bomb those areas. And that's exactly what they do. That's right. Yeah. I mean, they see it as a they see it as a bonus. They see it as a good thing because that's their 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 goal is terror. Their goal yeah, is, is, is 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 their idea. They're a terrorist state. I mean, in the in the most in the most simple way, they're trying to terrorize the Ukrainian population like they tried to terrorize the 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 Syrian population. So you're exactly right. So so what is it going to take, in your view? I mean I mean what is the what is the operation? What is the what is the the battle? that leads to winning the war? Uh, the main battle, of course, will be fought in the heads of Russian citizens, in my opinion, because uh, unless they realize that they will not survive being completely isolated from the civilized world and having a uh, tyrant ruling them and uh, things like that, uh, nothing will change. There will be wars like this one uh, in the future but they need to change themselves again because they were brainwashed for a century uh, it will take a while it's not gonna happen like tomorrow uh, but uh, when it happens and when they uh, change their their mind completely and when they uh, become democratic when they start respecting other countries when they sp start respecting freedom of speech you know all the rights of their own people um, I think eventually there will be no need to have NATO at all uh, in the future, in the distant, distant future. In, in, a, in a very, very distant future. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but, but speaking about uh, the, the goals that we have now is uh, basically eliminate Russian personnel as much as we can, uh, bring black uh, deliver a lot of black bags to every Russian house, and uh, we can do that as uh, as far as we can, we have a lot of weapons. We will be doing that because if we are conquered, if Ukrainian country, Ukrainian state uh, disappears, we will all be killed, and uh, we are fighting for our survival. Russians don't; um, they they are not aimed at you know. Uh, attaching Ukraine to Russian territory and uh, things like that. They aimed at elimination of uh, Ukrainians, of Ukrainian nation. Yeah. And that's, uh, that will be the beginning of uh, elimination of uh, European nations and then all yeah. the Western uh, democracy and Western civilization. I mean, you're, you're exactly right. That's, <laughs> that's been my read since the very beginning. That's why I always come back to the notion that Ukraine is defending the free world. It is defending all democracy and honestly all humanity, because you're exactly right. This is not you, you, Russia will not stop with yeah, Ukraine yeah. and never intended to never intended to. Yeah, so Starsky, we, joked, uh, we joked that uh, Ukraine is like a combat wing of a European Union. Yes, I mean, it is. It's the shield, right? I yeah. mean, that's what it is. Now. I see there's a lot of those drawings out there of of Ukraine being the shield, and it is, you know, and, and I mean, I, I wish we'd recognize, and, and I mean, we, we try to fight over here to help those who have a little bit of trouble recognizing to recognize that this is, this, this involves us all, that Ukraine is defending us all, that Ukraine is fighting for us all, and we better get our heads screwed on straight and support Ukraine properly, because, I mean, it, it's amazing the extent to which Ukraine gave us this second chance at life. I mean, if, if Ukraine hadn't fought, if Ukraine had fallen, we would be in a really serious World War III style situation right now because Russia would have 
had some kind of incursion into NATO. She would have had some kind of incursion into Taiwan. And we would, we would be in this kind of tyrants versus democracies um, world war. But instead, Ukrainians fought, sort of prevented that, you know, basically took the entire burden on, onto their shoulders. Uh, and now we have to support them properly. And, 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 and sadly, I think so far, we've kind of done the bare minimum. I, I mean, I, I, hope we, I hope we get past the bare minimum. But that's, that's kind of the way I felt. So We need that. We really need that. Starsky, thanks so much for joining today. It's great talking to you. Let's be in touch. Thank you so much, buddy. Bye-bye.